It's good to see so many familiar faces. We are racking our brains to find out who Yuzu Audio is. Uh, it's a mystery for us. You don't have to identify yourselves, but yeah, we're just curious. All right, why don't we get started? Um, thanks for joining us on a Monday. Um, this is uh, the third quarter 2023 uh, development update from the PKP development team. Um, if you'll recall, we had planned to host these on a quarterly basis. The only other one we did was Q4 2022, so we've missed a few quarters already, but um, we're gonna do our best to stick to this schedule and just provide a bit of a view into what the development team has been working on. Um, what uh, questions we have for how we're going to go about uh, implementing certain things and hopefully have a bit of a chance for exchange with the community as well. Um, I am Alex Metcher. I'll let other folks introduce themselves, um, but I'm the Associate Director for Development. Um, I know many of the people here just judging by the guest list. Um, and uh, I, as I said, I'm the Associate Director for PKP, which is based in Burnaby, uh, which is the unceded territory of Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh and Coquitlam peoples. Um, and I'd like to introduce the dev leads, we call them, uh, which are uh, Vitaly, and Bojana, and Divika, and introducing as well Yarda, who's joining us for the first time on these calls. Um, each of them will be presenting uh, something a bit later on, so they can say a word or two about themselves. Um, but we also represent the full PKP development team, which is uh, a considerable team of folks who work for PKP, but also works who work with many other institutions um, who do uh, development and translation and specifications and all sorts of things. So um, this is the collective work of the entire PKP community we'd like to present, but in particular, the development team. Um, we'd like to give you a chance to see kind of what's active right now, what's coming in the next year, um, and uh, get your feedback as early as we can. Um, first thing I want to do is present to say that um, 3.4.0, OGS, OMP, and OPS 3.4.0 have been released. Those were scheduled for release uh, late last year. Um, scope creep and testing and some complications struck us, but we finally made that release um, at the end of the second quarter this year. So we're very excited to have that one out there. Um, we're presenting the features that come in 3.4.0 in other venues. So I won't go over those in great detail, but just in short, some of the major features in 3.4.0 are the new submission wizard. This has a bunch of new features. It's uh, ready to be much more accessible than the last uh, submission process was. But it's also just a lot friendlier. There's uh, tools for the author to kind of review their submission at the end, to check and see whether there's any missing metadata, to save and continue if they want to come back later to their submission, all that sort of thing. Um, there's a more user-friendly editorial decision process that's been split into several stages. And there's a lot of new communications tools that have been pioneered there that we expect to be working into other parts of the, of the software. The stats have been completely rewritten, including institutional and regional statistics. We finally have, this is a small one, but actually it's a big one, um, HTML support in submission titles. So submission titles can now contain underline, bold, italics, that sort of thing, which is really important for especially biology journals where they tend to have taxonomical names uh, that need certain kinds of formatting. Um, behind the scenes for developers, there's a ton of code modernization. And so we've moved everything into PHP namespaces. We've added um, proper auto loading for all these classes. We have a lot of uh, work into the database to um, add enforced uh, foreign keys. Just a ton of work that um, uh, we're really excited to get released and that will reflect itself in a friendly environment for developers and uh, smoother upgrades because the data quality will be better. Um, all sorts of things you'll see rolling out over the next uh, years in the software and a lot more. Uh, I had hoped to get OGS, OMP, and OPS 3.0.0 3.4.0-2 out this week. Um, that was going to be on Friday, but we put it off to sometime this week. Um, essentially, the first release and uh, and the first uh, build after that, um, with a lot of new software, are going to have some issues and quirks and things. So we've got a large collection of those now ready to go out in 3.4.0-2 of fixes for those. And that should be a, a, a good release of the software. So watch for that. Um, if you've tried 3.4.0, uh, feedback is absolutely welcome on the support forum. Please let us know how it's going. There's a lot of new software in there, and we'd like to get feedback on that as much as we can. Um, next, I'm going to pass over to, to Devika to talk about prioritization, which is a major subject of work for us in the last year, I would say. Um, go for it, Devika. Thank you so much, Alec. So hi, everyone. So before I... Uh delve deep into what actually happened in the prioritization process. I just want to give you all a little snippet as to why we even set out to um, 
to a prioritization structured process in the first place, right? So uh, I think we're all aware that there's there's no shortage of initiatives or like feature ideas or problems that we in general have to solve right together. Uh, but while we're doing this, we're also making a lot of decisions. We're making trade-offs because while our ideas are um, unlimited, the resources that we work with and the time are limited, right? Hence the concept of the prioritization meetings uh, was initiated to better plan and integrate different ideas for our future releases and implement a 360 degree collaboration strategy instead of just a few selected people's perspective into what could be done um, for, you know, over the next years with our software, right? Alec, if you could move on to the next slide. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, to begin with, uh, we formed four teams, namely the scientific directors, the client servicing and publishing services, the third being development and design, and the fourth being operations and community engagement. So these teams got onto a brainstorming call to fill a three by three metrics, which consists of team resources um, and efforts on the X access and the intensity of pain needs wants of our users on the Y axis. So everybody got on the call and you know tried plotting the issues that they have heard um, onto this format, right? And um, the call was a lot of fun and became a groundswell for conversations between teams who were trying to make our software better. Uh, post the call, the team uh, collated all the issues raised during the call on a GitHub project spreadsheet, like you can see. And each team ranked the issue based on how important they felt it was for the community uh, post which uh, the directors from every team got on multiple calls and evaluated um, our current tech debt the priorities we had set along with the issues raised by everyone um, to form the priorities uh, for the development for 3.5 uh, which in some time Alex is going to make you go through so uh, before that I'll just give you a quick feedback on how the process went um, Alec, if you could move on to the next slide. So what went right in the process was that there was tons of resonance uh, when hearing issues raised by others that people did not think of. Um, also, it was a valuable way to collaborate within and across teams, perspectives, communities, and groups, right? Um, next, uh, like what uh, went wrong and what should we have avoided in the future was that um, if you see, we've got 600 plus issues on the GitHub. So the brainstorming um, should have been picked up from the existing issues and not from scratch, right? Moreover, calls like this tend to get, um, you know, one-sided with one person talking every, you know, like one person talking a lot and everybody just listening. And some people would not even have the context of what, uh, you know, is being spoken about. So that way, the structure and the process could have been managed better. Um, some of the issues were too fine-grained while others were too vague. Um, and the meeting was conducted on a short notice. There was a lack of cohesive ranking system. Um, and uh, there were different expectations and values attached to different metrics. So next, uh, what uh, will we be doing in the future and what you know could be done differently would be that together we are gonna be um, you know, identifying and including more groups to participate in the process and get external input. Um, you know, we are also going to brainstorm on scoping issues that would help, like, you know, if it, if the issues are short term or if the issues are long term or maybe get a mixture of both. Uh, we will also together try establishing uh, criteria for evaluation of priorities and guide user thinking um, along with, you know, setting uh, multiple meetings throughout the year and not just one. Um, and we're also going to be giving a lot of times uh, between uh, meetings so that there's a good amount uh, of time to process a lot of feedback, right? Um, so that's what we have in store for the future. I will now pass on to Alec to talk about the priorities that we've set for 3.5. Thanks, Tavika. Um, and I believe Alejandra's turned on the Q&A. So if you want to add any questions about any of this, um, please throw them into the Q&A tool, and then we'll make sure we address them when, when we see them if possible. Um, I will say the prioritization process 
reflects um, a thing we've struggled with for a very long time, which is that we simply have uh, a, a large community working in a large number of different publishing environments, be those different linguistic fields, uh, sorry, languages and language cultures and publishing cultures, or different um, uh, disciplines for publication. Law journals are very different than biology journals. And so uh, it's very difficult for us to kind of cohesively um, understand what a good set of priorities would be based on that diversity of input, um, compounded by the fact that we've never really had a uh, strong outreach to the community at large until just fairly recently uh, with Tabika's work to engage the community. So we're hoping to be a lot more transparent about how we balance priorities, but also just have a process internally so that we aren't constantly being um, pulled to one side by a sudden shift in uh, you know, a major funder or something coming our way. And then we're also trying to make sure that we don't uh, overload the team at the start of a, a development cycle, because typically what happens is at the start of a new dev cycle, we are very optimistic. We assemble a huge list of features and then we we parcel those out to various developers and everyone's kind of at their limit um, at the start of a dev cycle. But then things come in during the dev process that also uh, complicate things, new grants, uh, folks that we work with who have their own contributions to manage that we have to then kind of invest some time and effort into shepherding, et cetera. So, we're trying to make sure that we don't uh, um, keep repeating that same cycle of having everyone just sort of overloaded. Uh, and that we also still are able to move major projects forward in a way that's meaningful and speaks to all of the various folks who are uh, watching for us to um, you know, achieve new things. So with that said, um, the, the process Devika just described was then used to, um, to explore and shape the 3.5.0 roadmap. And you might be familiar with the old roadmap that we've had for many years, which is um, here on this uh, this Google this Google document. Um, I'm going to present in a moment um, a different form for this to be published, which we're going to shift to uh, before too long. Um, but just uh, for the moment, we have these major categories here that we call bundles uh, that we group the work into. This is called submission tracking management. And within that, there's a number of different tasks here that uh, that we've parceled out to various releases that describe uh, changes in the software. What we're trying to do is we're trying to capture fine-grained proposals for change, but we're also trying to group those into major headings so that when we come to tackling submission tracking, for example, as an issue, which you'll see, by the way, is probably the major feature for 3.5.0, um, we don't simply kind of tack on new fields and new options to the existing UI, but we consider it holistically so that we end up with a coherent um, interface at the end of it. Um, so reviewing the old, the old uh, roadmap, you'll see that, as I say, 3.5 has a lot of work allocated to submission tracking and management. But there's a few other features here and there. Um, we have a few UI improvements. We've got uh, a new place for JATS documents to live in the workflow. Uh, we have um, invitations for users to adopt a role. And this is in, in conjunction with uh, Craft OA grant. Our friends in Finland and also at TIB in, in Hanover um, ha are working on this quite a bit. And um, some work on, on IDs and ORCIDs and that sort of thing to merge, for example, the ORCID plugin from being a plugin into the core code base. These are all uh, pre-existing priorities that were set by the dev team um, at the outset of the 3.4 development process. But it was time for us to review this for the 3.5 process now that 3.4 has been released. So um, if I could just talk for a moment about the major features we planned for 3.5, I mentioned that major rewrap re submission lists. And this is an attempt to um, make the submission list uh, a much more capable place for editors to work with uh, the content directly. So previously it was necessary to um, have a good mental model of what submissions were active in the journal because the submission lists didn't give a rich enough um, at a glance view of that content. Uh, different journals need different things and it's really easy for us to pile things into that list to either make it overwhelming or just strip it down to the point where it's not really enough to, to learn about what's happening with the submission. Um, or if there wasn't enough information there, it was necessary to click on each uh, submission separately, go out to that page, review what's happening there, and then come back to the submission list, which is a very heavyweight kind of operation. So there's a lot of work going into that for filtering, for direct actions from the submission lists, and Vitaly will talk about that in a few minutes. Um, I mentioned already uh, integrating ORCID, um, but also credit uh, into the core app application instead of as plugins. That allow us to have a much smoother user experience than we've had in the past because plugins to do only so much before um, you really have to look at an integration to make it uh, smooth. Um, I will also mention uh, editorial board management. This is part of the Journal Integrity Initiative, which is one project we're working on. Um, this is just broadly speaking, an attempt to make it clear to readers of journals um, what the kind of overall publishing health of the journal is, whether it's being properly peer reviewed, whether it's indexed, whether it lists uh, important details like, uh, like supporting agencies, that sort of thing. So that if they're out in the wild browsing a journal, 
and they aren't sure how uh, how uh, responsible the journal is being about their publishing practices, they can see that information at a glance. But part of that is also recording information about the journal's editorial board to um, ensure that they're, they're, they're listing their editorial team, that where possible, there's an ORCID integration, for example, so that you can then see that same information reflected on the ORCID page. And again, vet the quality of the journal based on who's working with it. Um, and a bunch of other details like uh, multilingual metadata improvements, uh, a lot of stuff coming there. Um, so that's the pre-existing roadmap with a few of the changes included. There are a few um, specific changes I wanted to mention that we've made as part of this prioritization process. The first major change is that 3.5.0 will be an LTS release. Currently, 3.3.0 is an LTS release. We've been really pushing folks to upgrade to it to consolidate their hosting onto uh, that version so that uh, we, we can um, uh, maintain a single stable version know that we're, we're responsible for fixing it in terms of security and uh, major issues, if there are any. Um, and then we've moved on to 3.4 being a non-LTS release, which means that it's maintained for a bit of a shorter window. Um, when we commit to something being an LTS release, we commit to a three to five year maintenance process. So we're committing to that for 3.5.0, which we expect to be released uh, sometime next year. Um, and uh, when we release 3.5.0 and tag it with that LTS brand, you know you'll be uh, able to use that software for a period of three to five years. It'll be uh, maintained for security. It'll be reliable and so on. Um, we've added some areas. To, uh, so one of the things with an LTS release, by the way, is that we have to make sure our dependencies are quite up to date when we start. And so Yard has been working on upgrading Vue.js, for example, to a new version. Uh, Toehitter has been working on updating some of the dependencies on the PHP side. Um, things when they come out will be uh, up to shape and well-maintained with new dependencies so that at the end of that five-year window, we're not scrambling to keep older dependencies maintained that may not be formally maintained anymore, which we've experienced before. It's a, a painful thing to do. Um, we've added some areas here. So part of our challenge that I mentioned earlier when we're prioritizing um, a series of, of uh, improvements for a release is that um, there's high priority elements that we really want to get done, but that we don't have the resources to uh, commit to doing within a release cycle. Um, I, I recently heard this saying, and I, I probably pilfered from somebody on this call, so I apologize if I stole your saying, but when everything is important, nothing is important. And everything is important to us, of course. Uh, so we have to find some distinctions of importance and allocation within the list of necessary features so that we can actually meaningfully prioritize them. So we identified a few areas that were uh, of critical important to us, importance to us, but that we wouldn't be able to allocate the dev resources to implement fully within a release cycle. And so we're now toying with the idea of uh, performing the requirements work and research as part of a dev cycle, but not the implementation part. So this is kind of setting the stage for us to tackle the implementation in a future release without a hard commit to that. And the two areas we've identified for that are open data and continuous publication. Uh, people have been working around both of those requirements in kind of a, uh, an off the side of the desk way. People will do continuous publication, for example, by having an open issue in OJS and then uh, scheduling new submissions to it to publish those as we go. But we'd like a more fulsome implementation of that. So we're hoping to do some requirements work around that in the 3.5.0 uh, dev cycle, but not release that change within that software. Um, we've also added some quality of life improvements. Uh, working with the hosting team in particular, identified some priorities to the dev team that I personally hadn't been as aware of as issues needing attention. This just reflects on the fact that the dev team tends to work on their own machines, um, somewhat in isolation, and we're trying to, to improve that kind of flow through of, of feedback and so on. But the PKP hosting team is much more concerned with um, maintenance of large numbers of installs, with performance across the whole set, with uh, uh, import-export operations, with that sort of thing. So in conjunction with them, we identified that there are some areas for quality of life improvements in 3.5, and we're going to, at least in the case of optimization, make sure that we knit this into our dev uh, process so that we don't have to identify it as a priority. It's always a priority. So when we code a new piece of, uh, of work, if we know it's gonna have a major impact on uh, on many users, it's ideal for us to do some performance testing as part of the dev cycle and not as a separate uh, responsive thing when somebody says there's a bottleneck here, something's performing slowly. So in the case of submission lists, that's probably a very good example because submission lists work, um, compiles information from many parts of the system uh, and it's quite complex and then presents it into a single list. And so it's likely that'll have some performance uh, implications if we're not careful to do that work carefully. So um, at the end of the dev process, we'd like to um, do some review with some tools that we've been investigating to make sure that that, uh, when it is delivered in the software, is already tested for performance. Um, 
I'm alluded to the old form of the roadmap and a new place we're putting it. And I've uh, this is a work in progress. I'd love to get feedback from it. So if you have experience with uh, with these tools um, or some suggestions for how we could make better use of them, then please let me know. Um, obviously, having a roadmap on a spreadsheet is not ideal. We've done this this way for many years because it was a ready to hand sort of tool. Um, but I want to uh, shift us into a GitHub project. Um, GitHub projects have been we've been using these for a little while. Um, and they've recently been adding some major improvements that have made it possible for us to um, present the entire roadmap here. Um, so what you'll see here is you'll see a series of tabs at the top, which are for different releases, but also a table view and a timeline view. Um, I'm going to start with 3.4 here just because this is already released and it's not going to present any major um, surprises to anybody. Essentially, you'll see that the major things that were released in 3.4 are represented here, the major tasks. Um, this is very similar to if you were to take this uh, spreadsheet view and just look at the 3.4 column. If I look at 3.5, uh, we're now indicating that the LTS uh, status is, is here with the, the, the name of the tab. You'll see also, as in the public roadmap on the spreadsheet, we've got these major categories here that allow us to, um, to present major pieces of work uh, in a group, but also to break it down to individual tasks. One of the major things we, we get from using GitHub projects for the roadmap is that the status um, is automatically propagated. So um, in a roadmap here uh, using the spreadsheet, if one of these was finished, then we would have to uh, manually update the status of that. If we change the, the roadmap, um, sorry, the, the milestone to a different uh, release, then we'd have to manually update that as well. With a GitHub project, because the, the issue management on individual tasks and the project management of the whole roadmap are done in the same tool set, the status gets automatically updated here. So you'll see if I go to any one of these, I can pull open details. You can see which individuals assigned to the task, what the status of it is, what other projects uh, might be um, involved, and screenshots and everything else. You can stay in that same environment. So it should allow us to track things a lot more easily. Um, I'm going to show just a few of the changes uh, to the um, roadmap that were introduced as part of the, the work we've done here. Um, but just to say that there's a lot of richness in detail here, we're still exploring it. And uh, a few of the challenges that it presents to us are uh, just because of the way we're using um, our, our GitHub repositories. We have primarily most of our um, of our issues are in the PKP lib repository. So if I go to that repository, you'll see that we have a single repo, which has 642 issues. This is where the majority of the work happens within the team. But if you were to go to a, a plugin repository, let's say, um, Orchid profile, you'll see that it's also issue tracking within various other plugins and other repositories. And so there are new tools in the GitHub uh, project management tool set to draw them together. For example, uh, this list contains um, tasks that are both in the, the main PKP lib repository, but also tasks that are in other repositories. So you can mix and match. But um, with the use of things like, uh, like uh, milestones, uh, it becomes a bit more complicated. So if I go to a table view here, that um, we have uh, milestones from the PKP lib repository. This is specific to that repository, and we don't have access to the milestones that would be available for plugins, for example. So we still got to refine this a little bit. Um, what I would suggest is we're going to make the shift over to hosting on this tool set fairly soon. We'll announce it in the news for uh, for PKP's uh, uh, news area on the website, which is um, always in the top right corner. And then we'll we'll refine it a bit further. One thing I'm excited to start to work with on this that I have not really had the chance to explore that much is a timeline view. So um, in this in this uh, tool set, we'll be able to define start and end dates on individual tasks, and you'll be able to track what the progress of that task is across a calendar. So we've got, for example, if I go to next year, we've got an estimated date somewhere in here, yes, for the 3.5.0 LTS release of, I just threw a date of August 1st on there, likely to change, but um, you can imagine if we have dates populated for all these tasks, then we'll be able to track what the process is uh, real time. Our goal here is to expose a lot more information about what the dev team is doing and when they're doing it um, to our, our community than we've been able to do in the past. Uh, for the moment, you'll see things like in progress versus to do to indicate what's uh, already underway. And if you're curious about a specific task, um, this one here, for example, is a bit of a meta task on the submission lists work, which I don't want to steal from Vitaly's presentation, but we'll talk about that in a second. Right. Uh, next, I'm going to pass to uh, talk about Vue.js and plugins. But just to say, um, uh, I announced at the last meeting that uh, Nate was going to be leaving us, Nate Wright, um, and passed him all of our thanks and, and good wishes. 
Um, I'm very excited to introduce Yarda, who's taken up part of Nate's portfolio of work, which is the technical aspects of the UI management. He's jumped into a whole ton of things um, that we knew we needed to get done, but didn't have the resources for. So super excited to see those, those things going ahead. He's already proved himself um, extremely capable and uh, is working very well with the rest of the team. So it's my pleasure to introduce Yarda uh, to talk about Vue.js and plugins. Oh, thank you, Alec. Uh, hello, everyone. <clears throat> uh, just to briefly introduce myself. So I joined quite recently, as Alec mentioned, it's uh, I joined basically three months ago, uh, working from Czech Republic. Um, and my focus is really the front end part of the whole experience. So working on the UI and everything it uh, contains, meaning HTML, CSS, uh, JavaScript, Vue.js, and all these uh, technologies. The front end stack is quite complex and we need to have someone really uh, focus on that part. Um, so that will be my responsibility. And the topic that I selected uh, for uh, this meeting is the Vue.js in the uh, plugins. And just to set a little bit of the context uh, about the Vue.js. So we adopted Vue.js uh, for admin UI a couple of years ago. And the reason for it was quite uh, clear because uh, the admin UI is relatively complex. There is lots of interactive parts. And at the same time, we want to have very high level accessibility for all users, uh, high stability, and it still needs to be relatively simple to implement and create. And Vue.js offers uh, these things, and it's very good step up from the previous uh, stack, which was mostly uh, Smarty and jQuery. Uh, so obviously, things takes a long time to actually move from that old stack to the Vue.js stack. So we are moving along. Uh, lots of the parts are already using uh, Vue.js, uh, which is great, and we are trying to use uh, it more and more. Uh, Alec, if you can uh, maybe I'll switch to the next slide. Yeah. And uh, what, what I would like to touch on uh, this meeting is that uh, we would like to be basically, we would like to encourage you to use Vue.js in the plugins if you need to as well, if you are extending uh, the UI for the admin interface. And in many cases, you already can without creating your own Vue.js components, uh, because lots of the screens you can create through uh, forms. And the forms can be created and configured on the PHP side. Uh, and you can create lots of complicated screens just from the forms, like even like the plugin settings. But if you need to do something beyond that, uh, something more custom, every use case is unique, uh, then I think you should be able to leverage the same uh, technology stack as we do. And uh, on Copenhagen um, Sprint, uh, we discussed this and identified that there is no really good guidance or documentation how to do these things. And at the same time, there is quite a lot of demand. Uh, people are interested how to do these things. Uh, so we uh, discuss uh, how to improve the situation. And I believe that one of the uh, most straightforward ways to do for me as a creator and for uh, for plugin developers is to have an example plugin where you can see several um, examples uh, of different uh, cases rather than creating very long uh, documentation. Uh, so uh, as a as a result from from this uh, sprint, I created uh, example plugin uh, which. Uh, basically uh, showcase all these uh, options. So we can move to the next slide. And in here, you can see basically the UI, which is generated by this um, example plugin. Uh, it, it's being uh, like new tab, which is created by the plugin. And everything inside that uh, screen is generated by uh, custom Vue.js components that has been created directly in the plugin. Uh, but what's uh, also interesting is that obviously you can create your Vue.js plugin, which will do exactly what you need. Uh, but at the same time, we have our UI library, which consists of many uh, components, which has lots of these important things baked in, like accessibility. And uh, so if your use case uh, actually looks something that just using our components would be good enough for you, 
then I would certainly encourage you to do so. So one of the steps that I uh, did was exposing um, exposing the all the UI library components to be global so they can be uh, referenced easily from uh, the plugins. And in that example repository, which I created, uh, you can see example of that. But obviously, if you are in situation when you still need to do something uh, very specific uh, for your use case, you can create your UI, but you need to be more careful about the accessibility and all the different languages that might be using that, like uh, right to left languages, for example, yourself. Um, and uh, one, of, one, of the, one of the examples that I believe uh, can be useful is uh, showing uh, how you can use our REST API to uh, fetch some of the data from our API and present it uh, in, in the interface. And in the, if, if you look at the code in the example, it, it's very simple. It's, you will be able to understand it very quickly. So in on the screen, you can see example where I'm getting a list of the issues. I'm getting that from our REST API and I am using our uh, component from UI library uh, to uh, show that. Um, uh, can we move to the next slide? And here is basically just a conclusion to uh, take you uh, to the example plugin, which contains the most of the information. The important part obviously is also discoverability. So this will be a reference from the list of the example plugins, uh, which we uh, which we have. Um, we had a little bit of the troubles with updating the um, documentation or deploying the documentation. So that will be uh, resolved very soon. And so that should help you to uh, find it. And for the next step, I would really just to encourage you um, check it out and provide me feedback what you are still missing. What's your use case uh, that is not covered? And I will work towards, you know, uh, providing more information, more details, more guidance uh, on it for uh, next time. Um, uh, yeah, so thank you very much. That's all for my uh, part. And I would like to hand over to uh, Vitaly, uh, who will be talking about submission lists. Thank you. Thanks, Arda. Uh, I'm Vitaly Beshejko. I am based in Kyiv and I'm software developer at Workflow, uh, Workflow Lead. I think it's the first PKP Dev Lead webinar that I am present also, like Arda. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm, I, I don't have much to say about submission list because uh, the work uh, just started uh, and still a lot uh there are still some issues to do uh, bug, uh bugs and enchantments for the stable uh branch i mean three point four release uh can we move to the next slide thanks alec uh so this is the current uh, state of the submission of this ui that uh, lies in the main branch on the main branch and I believe the uh, final mockup wo was presented on on the last uh, webinar, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so, if you remember the last one, yeah, uh, there is still a lot of work to do. It's a basic template uh, for the submission list UI, and it's it doesn't contain uh, many elements in the UI itself. Uh, for example, you you can see that. Uh, uh, the old uh, navigation menu uh, on the left is still present there and it occupies a lot of space. Obviously, uh, it will be substituted for a new one. Uh, uh, on the left side also, after the uh, navigation menu can be seen uh, the support views. So basically it's shortcuts for editors uh, by which they can easily find uh, submissions they're looking for. And uh, it uh, utilizes a new uh, REST API endpoints for the dashboard. Once again, uh, still a lot of uh, work to do. Uh, as far as I remember, I implemented, uh, implemented uh, only half of them. And uh, uh, as Alec already mentioned, they're going to be a performance problem likely that uh, 
should be addressed that we haven't encountered before in the old submission list uh, because the way how uh, the architecture works, how the data is read from uh, the, the database. There are uh, a lot of information about submission uh, that uh, is received here, but that initially initially isn't used uh, in, in this dashboard view. Uh, so likely there will be a need uh, to change this uh, and to retrieve only the information uh, that is currently needed on this page. Uh, there's going to be uh, also a lot, a lot of work about the submission summary from which uh, the editor would be able, uh, ideally it should be implemented for the next release, yeah, but we will see, uh, we'll be able to make uh, decisions on a submission uh, by passing uh, the old UI, for example, like accept, accept the article or this line, etc. And it will, it will contain uh, actual information about the submission. Uh, there will be filters. Uh, the filters uh, going to be slightly different from those that we had before. So also some work uh, needed uh, uh, here. Um, and I anticipate the work on uh, editorial activity uh, column uh, where uh, we will see a, a short representation uh, or graphical representation of, uh, and a numerical of uh, of uh, let's say uh, number of uh, reviewers that are started requests or how many days let's say they are on this review stage uh, uh, what the la uh, latest activity that was done regarding this current, uh, regarding this submission so there will be a lot of useful shortcuts. It will be available right away in this on this dashboard. Uh, can we move to the next slide, please? Thanks, Ali. So yeah, uh, uh, as I said, uh, we are only on the uh, start of this implementation journey, and I'm currently starting to work on the changes on the REST API endpoints that I needed here. Obviously, a lot of work required regarding the uh, UI components. So e even the table we currently have the, uh, that is uh, uh, that can be seen uh, on the previous slide is, sub is subject to, uh, to change uh, to better support uh, the views. Uh, so the, uh, there's a lot of work on new components and extending all, all components also, um, like filters, for example. As one of you mentioned, uh, there are also potential bot bottlenecks that uh, probably uh, will be addressed uh, here on the submission list. Uh, I, I won't uh, uh, mention them uh, now uh, because it's still we still need to identify them. Uh, yeah, and uh, also. Uh, there are features uh, that are planned for uh, the 3.5 3 or later releases. It depends on uh, how much time we will have uh, before the next release uh, will, will come out. Uh, and you can find uh, all those features uh, which are definitely planned and uh, which are like optional features. Uh, by the link on the issue number 7495. Alec also already mentioned that issue. It's a meta issue which contains information about the work that is in progress regarding this issue uh, and links to other issues that addresses uh, submission list UI and related components. Uh, so we can tra track the progress there and also the list of optional components. Uh, and that's likely all that I wanted to present to, uh, today. And I think the next uh, Ayuda Vika, you will talk about invitation membership uh, and GDPR. Over to you. Thanks, Vitaly. So, um, again, I will just give you some context on um, the invitations, memberships, GDPR, and Craft OA. 
Uh, so basically, Craft OA conducted an analysis and found that the default OJS cookie handling and user invitation methods were not GD, uh, GDPR compliant and it required a customized local solution to comply with the policies for hosting facilities. Over and above that, as a part of our joint integrity initiative, uh, we analyzed that the community needs a seamless integrated way of not only inviting users to our softwares, but also uh, to the journal masthead without having to duplicate their efforts or you know take uh, multiple actions, right? So uh, to begin with, uh, we first analyzed the requirement and initial research, which was done by Craft OA and John on user invitation and masthead. Um, we then created a temporary user flow for both, right? Um, Alec, if you could move on to the next slide. Uh, at the Copenhagen Sprint uh, conducted in June, uh, we created a user group um, and um, analyzed the current GDPR requirement and set in stone a new process which could be beneficial for all participating um, in the process, like the editors or the users that, they, that are being invited. Um, the uh, process which is going to release uh, soon is, will give more autonomy and structure to inviting users and giving users more control over their data. So if um, here you can see here's the snippets for the kind of discussions we had at the sprint to figure out what is mandatory, what could not be, what kind of information can the editor edit, what uh, information can the user edit and things like that. Um, Alec, if it's fine by you, may I share my screen, please? So what I will do now is I will share um, and show you all um, just one journey and user flow of the new um, user invitation process. Of course, this is still a WIP and um, we hope to just, you know, refine it further. So if you see from the users and flow, uh, from the users and roles, uh, uh, section under the settings, you land onto this new um, table setting, which would be divided into invitations and users. In invitations, you can clearly see the invitations that you will send, um, you know, uh, to a new user, which, you know, their name and username would not be uh, reflected. Their email ID, the invitation, which is the uh, role that they're being invited for and the status. If it's being sent for somebody who is already in the system, you could see their name, their username. Again, the same information. If they're ORCID, um, you know, um, verified, you can see a little tag next to their name stating that these uh, users are ORCID verified. Then below that, you'd be able to see your whole users list, which would basically show your email, the role, and their often signed, right? From here, if you were to click on invite user to a new role, a pop-up would open, which would ask you to search for a user, right? So you can search for a user in the system based on their email address or their username or their ORCID ID. I will just specify that if you have a multi-journal installation, you cannot search for a user in another journal. You'd only be able to search for users who are a part of your own journal. Right. So if I was to type the email ID and I'd click on search, the first uh, check that the system would provide is if the user is already in the system. Um, if the user is yes, um, it will go on to proceed the show. But if the uh, if the user is not in the system, um, it's going to, um, you know, take you to the next screen where it says that the user does not exist in the system and you can invite them to take up a role. So here, as a part of invitation, the only information that you as an editor can fill is your email address or the ORCID ID and the roles. A roles would be in form of a new table, which is created wherein with the drop down like you do, like you would do on a LinkedIn, add the role, add the start date, um, or if you want them to appear in the journal masthead or no. Um, once you do that, you like click on send an invite to OJS um, and you'll get a pop up, a success pop up, which would, you know, um, show that, you know, the user has been invited and that you can track their status via notifications on your email. 
Now, once you've invited, the user is going to receive an email from OJS, which would give them more context on how the new process is GDPR compliant, how they could be a part, you know, how they could have to do the ORCID verification, what are the next steps, what are the roles that they're being invited for. And there would be two steps. One would be to accept invitation to the new role and one would be to decline invitation. If I was to click on accept invitation to the new role, I'd be redirected to ORCID where I could either skip the ORCID verification if the journal has not made it mandatory or I could like authorize access. Then I would move on to create an OGS account since I'm a new user uh, to the entire system. Um, if say I'm an existing OGS user, but not affiliated with um, uh, a journal, I would be redirected to a screen wherein I can give my access to the new journal, right? Um, I can put my username, my password. I can continue to give my email address. My ORCID ID is now being verified. My given name, my family name with an option uh, to sh make that information visible to the editor or not. I can click on save and continue. I would then be sent to a screen which would like uh, be able to review or create, uh, you know, review the account details and create an account and accept invitation. And I'd be sent to OJS um, to, you know, continue through the journey. So this is just one of the um, uh, journeys for inviting users to the OJS masthead. Um, I would uh, put this on GitHub and I would love some feedback on it as well from you all. But uh, for now, that's it from my end. I will pass on to Alec to give, um, to talk about our sprints. Thanks. thanks. And thanks to all the folks involved in Craft Away. That's a really great example of a kind of community led initiative that we can then work into our roadmap and um, uh, get some great things done that kind of uh, our, our needs and regional needs for the European Union, for GDPR, for example, that will then serve the whole community well, because of course, those kinds of same privacy concerns are also going to be relevant elsewhere. Um, I want to spend a few minutes talking about PKP sprints, and we're coming up to the hour, so I'm going to speak even faster. <laughs> no, I'll try and say less. Um, we recently had uh, two events. Um, these are both actually in June last year. Um, in Brazil, there was an event, I believe it was the, I forget the name of the institution now, uh, it's right here. I don't want to get it wrong. Um, there was an event in Brazil in Sao Paulo at the Biology Institute of Sao Paulo. Yes, correct. Um, and we also had a, uh, an event in Copenhagen, Denmark at the Royal Danish Library. Um, thanks very much to all the folks who host these events. Um, it makes it possible for us to go out and engage a broad community and get some work done that we, um, that we otherwise wouldn't be able to take the time to do. Um, there is, as I was just pointing to on the PKP news area, um, a listing of results from these different events. So you can read more about the PKP workshop, or actually a series of workshops. There's quite a long list of workshops. Um, and then the Copenhagen Sprint, we're publishing right now the uh, specific work groups um, results. So you'll see here, for example, there was a work group on importing content into OGS. And we have a series of these to also uh, follow up on that are still not published yet. Um, I want to make one plug, which was for a group I worked in uh, for a plugin called the Public Reviews plugin. And this is essentially a very quick plugin that uh, presents the results of the review process on the published article. So if you were um, wanting to expose the peer review process to your readers so they could vet the results for themselves, then they could install this plugin. And then uh, that would then show who the reviewers were in each review round and allow for the reader to view the, uh, the review reports as well. Um, this is a very uh, early stages plugin because we would like to get feedback from folks who want to use this sort of thing and uh, to have them help us to refine what direction they want to push the functionality rather than making assumptions, getting it a bit wrong and having folks need to rework it anyway. So um, please watch for the results to be published for that uh, part of the sprint group and um, help us to push that sort of feature forward. There is an upcoming event in September. Uh, that's the 11th and 12th in Hanover. And special thanks to Tib Hanover for uh, for hosting that. But again, this is going to be quite related to the CraftAway initiative. So if you're curious about CraftAway, um, if you are um, around the region uh, by some chance, uh, there's registration details uh, here. Or you can just go to events.tib.eu, click the workshops link, and then you'll see it's the top of the list currently. Register for that. Um, uh, I want to speak for a couple of minutes about developer environments. Uh, we've been talking within the dev team for a little while about um, what tools people are using, how they're set up, what's good, what's bad, and how to solve some, some common problems we've got. Some examples would be um, 
the use of debuggers. Uh, I don't use a debugger, which is kind of crazy, but we do have some folks on the team who have uh, set debuggers up in various ways. And we're looking to do some skill sharing within the PKP dev team. And I'm pretty sure that the same questions that we run into about how you're doing certain things, how you're uh, using the data sets that we publish, how you're swapping out different versions of PHP to test, how you're setting up different database servers to test on different uh, platforms. All those same questions we have within the dev team are likely to be useful to the external community as well. So we started to do a series of very short um, kind of presentations within the dev team, but also to, to capture those on video and to uh, publish them externally. The first of those was held recently about um, performance profiling. And I believe this is currently still unlisted, but we will have a place on the uh, YouTube channel where these will be captured. So we did a, a brief presentation of how to use um, uh, the, the standard tool set for performance profiling in PHP, and then how to visualize the call trace and find out where bottlenecks are and stuff. So we'll be using this kind of thing to um, refine our own internal process for optimization. And we'll be also publishing these videos for folks outside to uh, to learn. So um, watch for more of those to show up in the next little while. And, and uh, my hope is that we can provide a, a more friendly, standardized, capable developer environment for ourselves to use, but also um, one of the things we're trying to do, for example, is to adopt much more uh, use of the Laravel tool set. If we can standardize our tool set, um, the more it'll be possible for somebody who's come into working with our software from a general PHP environment where they've worked with, maybe it's a CSS tool set, maybe it's Laravel, maybe it's a, a, a standard IDE with a standard setup. If we can provide an environment for them to drop into that provides some familiar elements, then they'll be much uh, more able to jump in and start working. Whereas historically, PKP's had a very custom stack with a lot of um, very homebrew elements over the years. And we're trying to decrease those and, uh, and become a bit more of a, um, a recognizable configuration of elements. So do watch for those. Uh, we already have some Q&A coming in on the uh, Q&A tool. I've already answered some questions there. I see others have as well. Um, if you have any questions or would like to hear us elaborate on any aspect of this that we've talked about, um, please throw those in now. Um, I'd like to again say thanks to the Dev Leads team, but also to the Dev team that's been working so hard on all these elements for a while. Um, I did want to mention one thing that uh, Vitaly alluded to, but um, it's kind of a, a change in the way that we've done our dev work on major elements. In the past, um, so the submission lists that Vitaly was presenting are probably the single biggest part of the software, or maybe not the biggest part in terms of lines of code, but the most complex in terms of just being able to centralize all the information about the submission process and the workflow into a single place and then provide points to leap out to uh, work with individual submissions. So obviously our, our old practice of just giving it to a developer who had the best skill set to match and having them cut loose on it is not probably the best process for us in the future. And we've been working hard to establish some uh, areas of expertise that different uh, dev team members uh, are, are granted uh, the, the kind of scope to work on. For Devika, it's uh, obviously design. And uh, for, for Vitaly, he's got a skill set uh, on uh, workflow, but also he's good with Vue.js. Yarda is kind of our resource for, for Vue.js and for um, kind of the, the UI technical tool set. So those three are working together in a team on this uh, submissionless task in a way that we've really never done before, um, where each can kind of bring in their individual expertise. But also, um, rather than having one developer take away an aspect and everyone kind of having to stand back and not touch it um, until they're ready for a merge, at which point everything kind of changes and it's chaos for a while. We've um, allowed for that work to happen on the main branch. So right now there's a configuration switch in the configuration file of the main branch that allows you to turn on the new submissions tool set or leave it off and work with the old tool set. So now this major feature that's going to impact a lot of the software can evolve um, forward with folks either working with it or else waiting until it's ready for them to work on. So um, I think it'll be a lot smoother of an effort and much more of a team-based effort as opposed to segmenting off parts of the software for an individual developer to work on, which is what we've done in the past. Um, I believe we are just watching for questions to come in. We have one open question, but I think it was more of a comment to an individual. Um, there are some answered questions there. I don't know if anybody on the DevLeads team would like to speak to any particular uh, one of those. Uh, I see Mark's asking about what if authors don't have ORCIDs. Uh, we talk about this a lot. <laughs> we uh, we want to promote the use of ORCIDs and IDs more generally, um, but we also re recognize that some areas people want us to just require ORCIDs and have done with it. But uh, that's obviously not a decision we want to make on behalf of the whole community. So we're trying to make sure that we have both flows well supported. Um, and this is one of the reasons that we're looking to integrate ORCID into the core code base 
we can't require it, but we want both paths to be smooth paths. And uh, if you are working where there's one kind of default path that's integrated and one that's a plugin, the two will kind of collide in various areas. And it's usually the one that's the plugin that will lose out in terms of usability. So having the two both integrated um, and able to kind of jump lanes based on what the journal's configuration uh, is, is, is going to be a much better um, experience for users. Um, there was also a question about the plugin gallery. And I, I did want to say um, the plugin gallery has been great. Uh, it's been super helpful. If you'll recall back in the, the mists of time when, you know, maybe five or six or seven years ago, before we had the plugin gallery, the way people used to find third-party plugins was to go onto the forum and find a download link to a, a tar.gz file from the support forum. And uh, you can be pretty much guaranteed that the first time you tried this, you'd get a version that wasn't compatible with your version of OGS OMP and everything would break. You'd have to remove it and then try and find a better link or you'd comment and complain. That was the, the situation we had before the plugin gallery. And then we introduced the plugin gallery more or less as it currently still stands um, with a few tools for indicating who wrote it whether it's been reviewed by PKP, whether it's written by a, a partner of ours, or whether it's written by somebody out in the wild. Um, and we have a bit of an informal review process where uh, we'll review a submission to the plugin gallery uh, before we add it to the gallery. So there is some level of trust uh, um, just by virtue of its presentation there. But there's a lot of things we want to do with the plugin gallery that uh, we just haven't had time to put our, our minds to. Um, Maria was referring to um, whether or not we could, for example, require a baseline accessibility uh, standard for plugins before they're accepted. Um, my knee-jerk reaction is we don't want to introduce a high threshold for folks to get into the plugin gallery because um, if we set kind of the gold standard baseline, we just won't have many plugins. Um, I, I think there's some room for folks there to, to maintain it as a side project that maybe doesn't receive their full attention. That's the status of most of the plugins that third parties contribute, and that's totally fine. But we should indicate, um, well, we should do two things. One is indicate um, as much as possible to the end user who wants to use a plugin about what they can expect with it, and also set good standards for folks to be able to maintain plugins relatively painlessly. And I know there's currently some pain points around the way you get an update put in place, and there's also some work we have to do internally to make sure that things like UI tools are, are fully ready to provide folks with uh, an experience they can then make a high quality in a plugin. And I think Yarda's example of uh, Vue.js in plugins is a great example of that, right? Until this point, it's been very hard to do a Vue.js extension on a plugin. There hasn't been good examples and there's been a few gaps in the code base. And now we're starting to publish examples and prepare the code base in a way that'll allow for uh, good quality plugin interfaces to be presented without having to do a lot of sleuthing and a lot of uh, uh, custom work on your side. Um, any other questions that people would like to elaborate on from the dev leads? Perfect, we are at time. Um, I wanna thank you all for coming and the dev leads for sharing their work in progress. Again, I, I would really encourage you to uh, reach out to us if you've got any questions about anything that we presented. Uh, some of it's uh, work in progress, some of it's uh, things we've just released. There'll be lots of news coming on, especially 3.4, for example, but now that we're into this uh, dev cycle for 3.5, um, and now that we've gone through this prioritization process, uh, it means a lot to us to make sure that we um, articulate these things to the community in a way that's kind of uh, there for the uptake. So if you want to know more about um, things like the prioritization, prioritization process and how it's um, reflecting, for example, community feedback, uh, that's an area we know we need to work on. So Mark, your question about what happens with the uh, feature request part of the forum is a very good question. So um, please reach out to us. The forum is the best place, but we're also in Mattermost on the PKP Mattermost channel. We're in Mastodon just recently. We are on what was previously known as Twitter, um, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll watch for any feedback wherever you want to find us. And uh, we do welcome that, those questions. Otherwise, I'll leave it for there. Uh, fingers crossed, we'll have another quarterly dev session in the next quarter. <laughs> we'll see if we can improve our track record on that, uh, which previously is not wonderful. Um, but I hope you find these useful. And uh, I will see many of you in, uh, in Hanover when we're there in September. Thanks all and take care.